Well, good morning, Parkside. How we doing? Good. Feel good after yesterday, right? Yeah. Do we all see that? The T. Higgins touchdown? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who day? So uh, if you're wondering where our fearless leader is, it's amazing. He's actually going to be up there playing guitar while he's doing sign. You can just wave at Jake right there. Hey, Jake. I asked him if I could borrow a guitar and just pretend I could play like he does, but they said that was a bad idea. So anyways, let's stand up together as we... Uh, Love uh, our Lord and Savior and celebrate this holiday season.
tent for shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so Father, Lord, thank you so much for Christmas. Thank you for a time that we can come together and give our hearts to the light of the world, the peace, the joy, the all that you give us, Lord, in saving our lives. We're so thankful, Lord, for the gift of Jesus Christ. Please have all of our distractions, all of the noise, all the things that pull us away leave when we enter this building. Let our hearts be open to the word of God as we worship together. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Good morning, Parkside. After a prayer like that, I almost feel like I don't want to say anything else, right? Um, my name is Glenn. I'm privileged to be one of the elders here, and I've been asked to do some announcements because there's also one at the end that I want to really draw your attention to, but um, as I was thinking about what to say with that, I realized I could probably take over Randy's time, so we're going to pray that I keep that short, but I do want to draw your attention to some things that are printed out right here that are really important. Um, today is the day that the cookies are due, so on behalf of all of the incarcerated, thank you for doing that. Um, currently, we are not able to get into downtown. We can only get into like the Talbert houses in Riverside and so forth, or River City rather. So those cookies are going to mean a lot. So thank you to each of you who have brought those in. Um, if you are the last minute baker, check with Randy and see about dropping those off yet uh, tomorrow. He and I are going to de deliver those on Tuesday uh, for repacking. The big one that everybody keeps telling me, make sure you really emphasize this one, is Christmas Eve. So you know how many services there are Christmas Eve day? You all aren't going to have any problem with this. There's a 9.30. There is no 11 o'clock. So for those of you who are watching online thinking, well, you know, I'm out this week, but I'm in next week, and we'll make it for 11. No 11. Um, 9 o'clock, I understand, we'll have children's ministry. And in the evening, there are going to be two Christmas Eve um, services. So be aware of that. The details are down here in the lower part of that. Um, coming up in January, 
Matthew 25 serve day. There have been a few things sent out about that, especially to small group leaders. So if you receive that email and have those details and could share those with your groups, that would be great. If you need to know more, um, check out any of the leadership or any of the things that we're going to have up on the, um, on the presentation here. Um, but Matthew 25 doing some great things here in Cincinnati in the Lord's name. So um, consider that. I was not asked to mention on the 14th, but I will, because um, it seems like a good thing to, to bring up, which is the Hawksworth blood drive. Um, so make sure that if you've got a, an arm that you can lend to that, that you learn about the details there. All right. The other thing, and one of the reasons that as an elder I was asked to come up and speak about this is, you know what season it is right now? Giving season, right? Um, better to give than to receive and all of that. Well, it's also year-end, so it's a great time to be thinking about your year-end giving. And I thought about what I wanted to say with that, and man, you know, bring to the, the tithe to the storehouses and stories about the woman with the endless oil supply, uh, not the kind of oil we think about, um, but that's a good story to go back and reread because the interesting thing was Jesus had her bring in all of the cups from her neighbors so that she could fill them from what seemed like not nearly enough of an opportunity. So we could go on and on with stories from that. I'm going to just ask that the, the Holy Spirit would talk to you about what you should do for the end of the year and what you should think about for 24. One of the things that happens when we go to online giving is it's easy to just set the tithe and forget it and not give above and beyond when we have an opportunity or when we've been blessed. So I want to remind everybody at the exits, there are boxes on the wall with green dots around those. Those are very securely managed in terms of if you should feel so led to contribute to those above and beyond what you might be doing online. And if you're doing something next year or the Lord's blessed you with a raise, uh, it might be time to check in with the front office and see how you can adjust that online giving as well. So let's pray about that. Lord, um, it's really hard to fathom the gift that you gave us, uh, becoming incarnate, giving us a good witness, teaching us, but most importantly, dying and rising again to defeat death on our behalf. Lord, we know that all that we have is from you and that you give us the opportunity to steward it. And so we just ask that you would give us wisdom here. Uh, Lord, if we're struggling to meet ends, um, Help us to understand what your, your will is there, that, uh, that maybe you're not calling us to empty our, our oil or our wallet, um, but that you're asking us to, to reach out for some help. But Lord, if you've blessed us, um, speak to us. Tell us where you want those, those funds to go and how you want us to use them. Help us also to understand that as we live generously, that doesn't just mean money. It could be our time. And we may have some more of that than we do money that we can donate. And so, Lord, we just pray that as we go through this busy holiday season, that we would remember to take time to say thank you to you and to those who have blessed us, and that you would guide and direct our steps, that it would bring honor and glory to you into 2024. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shepherds are binding their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, well, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they are so afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, I bring you good tidings of great joy, 
of great joy, of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. And you shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, wide in a manger. And suddenly, and suddenly, suddenly, and suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, praising God, praising God, and saying, Glory, 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 glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, 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 and goodwill towards men. And that's what Christmas is all about. Morning, Parkside. What a great way to start the morning. What a wonderful video of our children, right? Man, it just makes my heart just jump for joy, seeing all those beautiful faces. And that's what we've been talking about the last uh, few weeks is the light before Christmas. And we've talked about how that light that God was sending would bring hope. And we talked about how the light brings peace, and that light is Jesus Christ. And then last week, Matt talked about joy, how the light brings joy into our lives. And today, we're going to look at how the light reveals God's love. But before we get started, uh, let's bow for a moment in prayer and just invite God to really calm our thoughts, our hearts, and we want to invite him into this place in a special way as we look into his word. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for who you are, the one true God. You are the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three yet one. You are our hope, our peace, our joy, and it's your love that sent you to this world to die on a cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are, for all you have done, are doing, and promise to do. And as we look into your word this morning, May you open our eyes to see, may you open our hearts to receive, may you open our ears to hear. May we glorify you, may we praise you and honor you, for you are worthy. It's in your most beautiful, holy, precious name, the name of salvation that we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, well, so we're at Christmas, right? Next week is Christmas. Hard to believe, isn't it? This year has flown by. Have you ever really had something that you were expecting, that you were so excited about that you were willing to wait as long as it took to receive it? Now, for me, it was uh, when my wife Janet and I were dating, uh, I could not wait to see her every day. I would wait in the common area of the university and just expectantly keep looking around for her face. Still do. Can't wait to get home in the evenings. Can't wait to spend time with her. Even if it's just sitting side by side on a couch. I love my wife. Okay? But when I was a kid, I really loved Matchbox cars. And so I was in great expectation as a child of what was underneath that tree. 
For some of you, it may be a relationship. It may be that you greatly anticipate and are looking daily for maybe uh, that special somebody or a car if you're younger or whatever it could be. It could be a promotion at work or something of that nature. But have you ever had a time when you were just so expectantly waiting for something? Well, today we're going to look at Luke chapter 2. We're going to pick up where Matt left off last week, verses um, 21 through 35. We're going to pay special attention in the beginning here to verses 25 through 35. But let me set up the story. Okay, so at the uh, end of Matt's message, you know, Jesus is born, and you have the uh, angels and the shepherds praising God and glorifying God. And now in verse 21, we see where Jesus, with his mother Mary and his stepfather Joseph, they have come to the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus has been circumcised as per the law after eight days, and uh, they have to bring Jesus back about 33 days later and to dedicate him to God per the law and for Mary to go through the purification rites that were required according to the law. So Jesus and his mother and stepfather, they're in the temple, And this is where we pick up in verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel." Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the mother, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Simeon was, this is the only place in Scripture that this man, Simeon, is mentioned. He was a righteous and devout man. He wasn't righteous or devout because of doing good deeds, though that's what he did his life to. He was righteous before God because he had faith in God. He believed in who God is and what God was doing and had promised to do and will do. He believed in passages like Isaiah 9 that predicted the Messiah, the very child he was holding in his hands that morning. Isaiah 9 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. There will be fuel for the fire, for for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the lords of heaven's armies will make this happen. Simeon believed this. He believed that God had promised a Savior, a Messiah. And just like in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, that says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he 
speak and not act, that he's promised and not fulfill. Simeon believed that God spoke. Simeon believed that God would fulfill his promises. And so Simeon expectantly, daily, was looking for the Messiah. The one who would bring peace and justice. Who would relieve the burdens. Who would set things right. And because he devoted his life to God, God promised to Simeon that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Savior, the Messiah. When I read that, it made me, uh, kind of convicted me, made me think, Randy, are you also expectantly looking daily for the Lord's return? Jesus has come. He has died on the cross. He has saved us from our sins, so if we put our faith in him, and he has gone back to heaven, but he has also promised to return. I don't know when that will happen. All I know is, is that he is God and he fulfills what he says. And so am I living my life in expectation of seeing my Savior? But even if I do not see the physical return of Christ, I know that I will see him face to face. Some point in my life, I will die. This body will cease to exist. Am I living my life like Simeon in anticipation of that moment? Am I living by faith? Am I prepared to meet my Savior? Now fast forward about 30 plus years where we see another man standing in that same temple, maybe at the same spot that Simeon was standing. And in John 8, we hear this man say, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Isaiah foretold the coming of the light. Simeon held the light in his arms. And now that very light, the man Jesus Christ, was standing in that temple proclaiming, I am the light. When Jesus said, I am, He was clearly stating to his listeners, I am God. I am the promised Savior. I am the Messiah. There are seven I am statements in the book of John. This is the second of those. And I am, if you read in your scripture, you'll see I am capitalized. Why? Because in the original language, what Jesus was saying was very clear. He was saying that I am. That is a title for God. And on one of the occasions, the people clearly understood what he said, and they picked up stones to stone him to death. When Jesus here says, I am the light, he's saying, I am God. I am your promised Messiah. But why else would Jesus use the term light? Light's a common metaphor throughout Scripture. It's used often to describe truth. Is used often to describe holiness and purity. But light also has some wonderful qualities that help us to understand who Jesus is and why he came and why he matters to you and me personally. Light is an agent that is often used to illuminate, to reveal, to point the way. Light is often used to help sterilize and heal wounds. Light gives warmth. It gives security. It gives hope and help. That's who Jesus is. Light's used as a beacon. Think about lighthouses or beacons on tall towers. Those lights are used to warn of danger, but also to guide travelers to safety. That's why Jesus came as the light. God loves us so much that he personally came to reveal the way for us, even at the cost of his physical life. Jesus is the light. He calls on us to turn from our darkness, to turn to him, 
to place our faith in him and say, Lord, I need you. You are the light. I repent of all the sin in my life. I turn away from that sin and I turn back to you. Jesus says, here I am. Do you believe in me? Are you willing to receive me? Are you willing to surrender your life to me, to submit your will to mine? If you do that, if you place your repentant faith in me, you too can be a child of God. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The light reveals that. Jesus is not just revealing the truth. Jesus is the truth. And by knowing the truth, we will be set free. But it's not not Jesus who is the light, or even a select few. You yourselves are God's light. If you think about Ephesians chapter 5, we read, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good, right, and true. We all, at one time or another, were lost in our sins. We're living in darkness, enslaved to the darkness, enslaved to our sin, whether we realized it or not. And then Jesus, that great light, foretold in passages like Isaiah 9, broke through the darkness in each of our lives. And we turned to that light. And we made a choice. I choose God. When we did that, we're no longer children of the darkness. We're now children of the light. We now have the light in us. We now walk in the light. That's why Jesus in Matthew 5 says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts, then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand. There it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Jesus has gone back to heaven to await the appointed time for him to return. But until that time, you and I live in this, on this earth. We live in this world. And just like in Jesus' day, this world is filled with darkness. It's filled with hatred and evil. The Reverend Martin Luther King says, darkness cannot be driven out. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Jesus came to to defeat the darkness, and he did that when he hung on the cross for our sins. But today, you and I are his messengers. We're his ambassadors to this world. We're his messengers of reconciliation, his ministers on his behalf to this world. We're the light that now shines out into this world saying, there is a God who loves you. The darkness in this world, and just turn on your news, you see it all around you. You see all the things going on in our world today. There is great darkness. But it wasn't just, just now. It's been going on since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. But darkness is defeated. Evil is defeated. Hate is defeated by God's light that reveals his truth, that reveals his love. We are products of God's love. And so we should be sharing that light with anyone and everyone we come in contact with, even our enemies, even those who mistreat us, those who spit upon us, who slander us, who imprison us, who kill us because of our faith. We should love them with the same love that God has shown us. We're to be light to the darkest corners of this world. And there's darkness that surrounds each and every one of us. But it's God's light working through us that reveals God's love to people that will defeat the darkness. 
that will defeat the hatred that we see in our world today? Are we willing to be that light? The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2 says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them, even for your enemies, even for those who have turned their back on Christ. Still pray for them. Still intercede on their behalf. Still love them with a selfless, self-sacrificing, unconditional love, the same love that God has shown to us. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Do you get that? God wants everybody to be saved, and he wants everyone to understand the truth. And who and what is the truth? The good news that God gives us grace and mercy, that God loves us so much that he himself humbled himself, stepped off his throne in heaven, took on flesh and blood, being born as a helpless child, and then at the right time proclaimed the message of repent, turn to me. God loves us so much. He loves that person, no matter who they are. He wants them to know the truth. That's why passages like John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why passages like Romans 5, 8, that says, God demonstrates his own love for you in this, that while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. Passages like 1 Peter 3, 18, that says, for Christ died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? To bring you to God. And now God has given you and me that message. We're to be praying for those around us. We're to be sharing the love. We're to be sharing the light that God has put in our hearts. The message is found in verse 5. It says, for there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave the world at just the right time. And that's the message we should be proclaiming. But we can proclaim it not just through our words. We can proclaim it through our attitudes. We proclaim it through what we say and do and what we don't say and what we don't do. We are God's chosen instrument to reveal his love to this world. You don't have to be a minister like myself. You don't have to be a missionary that goes to some faraway land. You are a missionary. You are a minister right here, right now, right where you are. You are a a minister of light to your family, to your spouse, your children, to your parents, to your siblings. You're a minister of reconciliation. You're an ambassador to your neighbors to your co-workers, to the stranger on the street that you notice is having a hard day. Acts of kindness. Taking time to come alongside of somebody and just sit with them and listen to them. Visiting people in the hospital. Visiting people in jail. Visiting the poor. Going and helping You say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Absolutely right. You don't know, but God does, and God loves you, and God has chosen to work through you. He will give you the words to say. He will help you. He will enable you. He will equip you. That's part of what the purpose of church is. Church is designed and is meant by God to be a place where we come together to worship and praise God and giving him thanks and gratitude for who he is and all that he has done and promises to do. But it's also a place where we can encourage each other, spur each other on, a place where we can learn not only God's word, not only to gain knowledge, but also understand how we can go out into the world how we can let the light that God has put in our hearts through his Holy Spirit shine. It is all about love. 
Jesus in John chapter 13 says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. When Jesus said a new commandment, actually the commandment to love others was already in Scripture. When he said it's a new commandment, what he's saying is, I want you to love the way I loved you. I want you to love others with unconditional, selfless love. Sacrificial love. That's revolutionary back then as well as today. And to be honest with you, I have struggled with that kind of love because I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. So I constantly am praying to God, help me to see people as you see them, to love them as you love them, because I don't want to. The world would be a great place except for the people. I'd love to be here with nobody else. Well, with my wife, my kids, my grandkids. But the fact is, is that we live in a world that needs Jesus. And so I do it not so people will say, hey, look how great Randy is or look what he's doing or whatever. That's the wrong motivation. I do it out of love for my God who demonstrated his love for me by paying the ultimate sacrifice. It's the least I can do. God tells us in 1 John chapter 4, Verses 7 through 20, he says, the apostle John, he says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son, into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, if we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world, and all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God, we know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people, we can see how can we love God whom we cannot see. And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. It's all about love. In these 13 verses, it averages out that love is used, what, twice per verse? That's a lot of love. 27 times the word love is used in this passage. That should indicate just how important love is. How important it is for us to understand just how much God loves us 
and just how important it is that God wants us to share his love with others. It really comes down to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love others with that same kind of love. That's the greatest commandment. If we focus on that, if we concentrate on that, this world will be transformed. People's eyes will be opened. Hatred will be defeated. Darkness will be driven back. We all have a role to play. We all have a stake in this world. And God's saying, I want to work through you. And I want to work in you to be my light and to share my love. So in summary, as the worship team comes back on stage, Simeon believed the prophecies about the Messiah. He was looking, personally looking for the light. And then Jesus shows up. The light enters into the world, and with him is peace and hope and joy and forgiveness and all those wonderful things that we all need. And then Jesus, at the right time, stands in that very same temple, and he declares, I am God. I am your Savior. I am the Messiah. I am the light that reveals the truth and the way. the light that leads to life. And then Jesus, before he returns to heaven, commands us to be his light on his behalf to a world that still needs hope and love. All because God loves us and he wants people to be saved. So if you have your communion packet, go ahead and take that out. If you don't have one, there's at the tables at the back and to the side, there's these little plastic bags that have the communion elements in it. I'm going to pray and then give you an opportunity just to reflect on what God is saying to you personally. My encouragement is this. Communion is a special, a wonderful time to focus on who Jesus is, to focus on what he has done, to focus on what he is doing in your life today, and to focus on anticipating what he will do in your life to come. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the fact that you are our light that you entered in this world to reveal the truth and that you are that truth. We worship you and we say thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you came and died on the cross for our sins. But you didn't just stay dead. You were alive. You rose again and you're in heaven and you're coming back. May we expectantly be looking for you every moment of every day because we don't know when you'll return. Or we don't know when we'll see you face to face. Only you know that. But we want to be prepared. We want to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. We want to be ready for when you do come, Lord. Like Simeon, may we be righteous and devout people. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. May your love fill us so full that we have to give it away to other people. May your spirit fill us May you use us. May you use us to drive by the darkness and the hatred that's in our world today. In Jesus' holy and precious name, the name of salvation that we pray. Amen.
you all could uh, stand up for our final song of worship. Christmas is coming. Doesn't it feel good? Have a wonderful week, Parkside. Merry Christmas.